When a billionaire invites you to spend a week on his super yacht in the tropics, you don't turn it down. Lord Robert Edmiston is a businessman, visionary, and benefactor. I know him as Bob. I've always respected his humility, integrity, and faith, and experiencing a slice of the billionaire lifestyle, I couldn't shake my curiosity around the idea that he had money, but money didn't have him. I took the opportunity to sit down with Bob in his home and have a conversation about aspirations, perspective on wealth, and how to be rich in more than dollars. Well, hello, Bob. Great to have you here. You're a God-fearing man, a family man, and a businessman. It's such an honor to have an opportunity to touch base and chat life, wealth, and perspective. I want to jump straight in. Tell me, did you always want to be a billionaire? Um, no. When I was young, I just wanted to be happy. And then I got married and had a family. And then I had a lot of responsibilities then. And uh, my son arrived when I was 22 years of age. I got married when I was 20. And so necessity drove me to uh, actually try and earn more money. But at some point, did your aspirations change from needing to provide to then the pursuit of money? I am an accountant. It, took me quite a number of years to qualify. I was 27. I only actually started studying when my son arrived mm. uh, uh, because I needed more money. And so I understand numbers. And to me, money is the scorecard mm. in terms of success. I think for other people, it's uh, maybe a fine piece of art that they do or whatever it is. But uh, uh, numbers are the things that uh, make sense to me. So I always had an aspiration to be worth about 50,000 pounds by the time I was 30. Okay. Um, and that would, in today's terms, be worth perhaps uh, 200,000 pounds, mm -hmm. actually. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, prices have gone up quite a lot in those uh, intervening years, and um, 44 years ago. Yeah. Um, but uh, my current uh, success was really way outside of my expectation. And of course, uh, we always want the next target. So when you achieve 100,000, then you want 500,000. Sure. Then you want a million and then et cetera. So we've always got these sort of benchmarks we're aiming for. And when you reach those benchmarks, was there a sense of fulfillment? Uh, I think uh, uh, there is a satisfaction in that, mm. but it, it means that you set yourself another benchmark. So we're always searching for the next level. And then it gets to a point where it's virtually unattainable. Mm. Aspiration, ambition is a good thing, uh, so long as it's in its right place. So when you say that money becomes the scorecard, would you say now that you've, not, you, you've stopped setting benchmarks? What happened to me one time was um, I thought, what's the point of making more mm. of what you've already got more than enough of? Because what do you do? You make more than more than enough and more than more than more than enough. It, it becomes a pointless exercise yeah. at a certain point. Although the number itself is, is satisfying, it actually is a pointless exercise because I'll end up dying leaving, uh, leaving it all behind anyhow. H how did you get to that point? To you the point to of realising your perspective of wealth had changed? Um, I think as you get on in life, and you can have all these things, you suddenly realize, actually, they by themselves don't bring happiness. Mm. I've very early on understood that it actually wasn't going to make an eternal difference. Whether I was successful or a failure, or whether my company grew great or, or it didn't do very well, I thought to myself, I used to walk in the car park and think, in 100 years' time, who's going to know? Mm. Who's going to care? Will they ever know anything about what happened and will it have made any difference uh, because I don't know my great-grandfather sort of five generations ago I don't know whether he was good or bad or what, what he achieved uh, and I love that thing on the cenotaph in London where it's, uh, it talks about the unknown soldier it says known only to God mm. and all true records are known to God the only permanence we have is in the eternal God um, and when we come to know him, that makes all the difference mm. because there we have something that's going to last. You know, uh, if you look at the church, you would think it's totally disorganized globally. And yet 2,000 years later, it still survives. Yeah. And it's grown and it's all over the world. Uh, yet there's no 200-year-old companies. 
So even with our best organisation, our best minds and uh, highly educated people running all these corporations, very few of them are going to last. So true. We are here temporary. Hmm. Uh, our life in the space of eternity is just a click of the fingers. Yeah. It's a fraction of time. Eternity is forever. There's a purpose beyond this life. This Bible t tells us this, what shall it profit a man mm. to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? Mm. And so what God's actually saying is if you had a balance and the, on the one hand was a soul and the rest was the treasures of the whole earth, if you would look at that balance, it would go like this in mm. God's perspective. Mm. And the scripture tells us, eye has not seen, mm. nor has ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Mm. So I look at this beautiful world we have and imagine a heaven which is infinitely more beautiful. Uh, and I get to see some of the most beautiful parts of the world. But to imagine that something is going to be infinitely more beautiful and we can spend eternity there. Yeah. What a wonderful payoff. So you would say as a businessman who invests in many great things, to those who also do the same, it, it may be worth also considering investing in your soul. The investment's already been made. Jesus died on the cross to save us. All we have to do is accept his offer of salvation. The Bible says also, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you and take his burden upon you. When I've got a problem, I talk to him about it. Well, God, what shall I do about this? Mm. Um, and increasingly as I get older, I'm understanding the benefit of just involving God even in the little things the things that seem to be of no consequence. There's nothing wrong with aspirations. You, you recommend that you, you're a man of aspiration yourself. What would you say to someone who has great aspirations, but all their desire is in, in gaining material wealth? Well, I think at the end of it, they're tra chasing a rainbow, basically, because there's always this desire for something more. Mm. And at the end of that, you still have that inner dissatisfaction, that inner looking for meaning in your life a meaning above and beyond just material wealth and mm. self-aggrandizement. You know, we can just feed ourselves in a selfish way with, with all these things. But ultimately, there is no satisfaction in that. Uh, and uh, we still have to die. Yeah. And what, you know, what, why would we spend our life living and fighting all the uncertainties in business? There's so many uncertainties whether there might be a war in the Middle East or whether there might be an economic crisis mm -hmm. or a financial crisis. All these uncertainties we're always preparing for in business. And yet there's an absolute certainty we're going to die. Mm. Uh, so I'm really, I feel contentment. The Bible says happiness, uh, happiness is based on happenings. Mm. When good things happen, you're happy. But, but life is not like that. What happens when you get ill? It, you're not happy, but contentment, it says godliness with contentment is great gain. Mm. And in whatever circumstance to find yourself content, that's a huge win. Would you say you're content? Yeah, yeah I would. Well Bob, it's been an honour to chat. I really appreciate hearing your perspective on life, on aspirations, on perspective, on worth. You're an admirable, honourable man and I just want to thank you for the opportunity to, to sit and chat. Thanks, Ruben. Appreciate it. It's been a pleasure.